Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first edition of TestMU. We are extremely excited to host everyone here today. I am Shantanu, and I'll be your host for this session. Before we start the session, uh, I would like to thank all our partners for supporting and promoting us for this event. Uh, we encourage all of you to go and check out their booths from reception if you wish to connect with them later. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our speaker, Mr. Soumya Mukherjee. Soumya is an engineering leader with over 17 years of experience. He's designed and distributed scalable platforms, solutions, and architectures to create applications with seamless, secure, and reliable experience. Soumya is also a mentor and loves to help others and share his experiences. Soumya has also authored books on Selenium that were published by Tata McGraw-Hill and Amazon. He has extensive experience doing smart automation with various tools and tech stacks. Today, he is going to explain why test recommender systems are the need of the R and how they can help us pinpoint the tests that are affected due to a specific build change and could be considered for a targeted regression. In short, we need to be smart to identify the tests that affect the system due to a code change. Now, let's get right into it. Uh, the stage is all yours, Samya. Thank you very much, Antanu, for uh, giving the introduction and welcome everyone to the session. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the test recommendation system. It's more like how you can design one. Obviously, I cannot share any code because of the, the compliance issues. Right, but I will not be teaching anything new here. Probably everybody knows, uh, you know, uh, and we are actually practicing the same, uh, you know, in our projects, but uh, somehow it is getting missed. We would use those points uh, and, uh, you know, talk through, you know, how we can remove those challenges and, and can design a recommendation engine. Okay. So, uh, just sit back and relax and and you know i'll start the presentation shantuni can you confirm if you see my screen um yes sir. awesome so uh, thank you um let me first give you a brief introduction uh, about me uh, I have overall of around 17 years of experience. Uh, this, this, this is a huge timeline, right? But I just quickly touch upon, you know, what are the core things that I've done uh, during this uh, 17 years. Um, I started my career as a developer, then moved to QA, uh, just to understand how QA works. I wrote my first platform code to basically connect uh, tools like UTP, WinRunner, uh, LoadRunner, okay, interface with with a middleware so that you know we can schedule tests on them. Uh, way long back in 20, 2007, uh, learned basics of QA uh, because if you do not know uh, the QA basics, then you know it does. Uh, you will not be able to automate it. So that's what I believe. 2009, I wrote an enterprise tool on on automating the the apps which works with Tipco and MQ. This is for a large bank. 2010, I started my own consulting company. I worked with various exchanges uh, to do the performance testing for them. Uh, I did a lot of a uh, lot of a uh, lot of projects with the financial institutions to cut down this QA cycle time. I for published first book of mine on Selenium when just Selenium was pretty new in the market. Um, and uh, then I also wrote uh, a plugin which basically would uh, run the tests parallel uh, with Hudson. Now, now Hudson name is Jenkins, everybody knows it. 2012, I was purely into the core development and designed a core banking application created a high volume transactional based system for yarn trading uh, and wrote my first product, uh, which was a scriptless automation framework, which which was helpful to automate both mobile and web apps uh, using uh, the using the same case. So you need not to code twice, but then you can reuse the same lines to basically automate both. 
web and apps i started a mobile testing company called correcto app um, it was app test pro then then it was correcto app uh, i service some of the biggest startups with that tool uh, wrote another tool to check the performance of the apps um, 2015 i wrote another book which is then i published in amazon um, on selenium uh, this book was mostly for folks who fear coding and want to explore automation uh made correct web profitable wrote a lot of programs uh and uh, courses for devops workers alliance on the devops side 2017 i returned back to corporate to build the engineering teams i predominantly help teams to cut cycle time be it on the development side qa side uh and anywhere in this uh journey i have done my master thesis on recommendation systems and that's where the fascination about the recommendation systems uh, that i have you know I, and i can constantly work with them so that's pretty much about me uh, i'm right now an engineer at apple um, i manage uh, programs uh, where they are extremely agile uh, can't reveal much but uh, but yeah so so majorly to to cut down to a cycle time um today for the agenda uh, we would see what do you mean by recommendation system because there are folks who may not be aware of what they are um we'll see talk about uh, some problem statements that we have in qa uh what can we do how it was done previously how it is done now uh, we would see some approaches uh, we will see how we can build a model uh, i'll give you some basics about which model can you use to be to create the recommendation engine and then uh, some tools you know if you guys want to explore and connect different tools to to make one you can basically start working with these tools uh, with that uh, thanks to the datascientist.com that i took the picture from uh, there are various type of recommendation systems in the market uh, the first one is the item hierarchy based system which predominantly would lead you uh, to to buy an additional thing uh, because you bought something else like a printer so if you have bought a printer you need an ink second is the attribute based recommendations so since you like the movie uh, starring somebody some actor you may also like his movie um then comes collaborative filtering there are two types which is item item which is the, which means that if you like one item you may like other one related to it similar to it secondly uh, user user similarity which is uh, which is if 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 uh, there is a connection of mind to something uh, you know i may also like it uh, there are social interest based graph based uh, recommendations for an example if you if your friend like something you may also like that and then you can build your hybrid models uh, using svm ld and svd i uh, will not go to specifics of these models but you can uh, read through them uh, beyond this there are newly built systems that are there in the market which is the context aware based one which basically takes a context for an example i like a toy uh that i want to buy and then i am standing at let's assume a location it basically uses the location and the uh the context to basically tell you what recommendations you have second is the time aware uh that what time of like for an example i want to buy a toy and uh, i would go to the market at say you know 9 am in the morning like it would basically give me uh Uh, uh, a recommendation based on the time um uh, the the location and the the uh, obviously the item that i want to buy there are some recommendations which are knowledge based uh, which you would see in big banks uh, they would use knowledge based uh, recommendations and you would see ontology based so you can read through them uh, but these are some of the recommendation systems that we have uh, <clears throat> in the market and you know uh, big companies uh, uses these recommendation engines to basically uh, 
basically you know um, get the users buy the product um having said that uh, you know and and i was listening to the the panel discussion before this and i've heard uh, vikul saying that uh, you know he gave an example right you know uh, that he has only 4 days of testing time and then he doesn't have that time to basically do the complete tests so we would see that you know how we can basically remove that issue uh, or a problem right? then uh, he did correctly mention that data is data can be crap because it is situational based and uh, in sometimes uh, some applications may spit out some kind of a data versus uh for for some other application there was some kind of a data some other kind of a data but what we can what we would see today is how you can standardize the data set because uh in order to do uh, and and make your recommendation system works you need to basically standardize your data <clears throat> and i'll show you how you can do that uh, uh on the other side uh, uh priyanka did mention that she did she she did not see uh a tester and a good programmer but we have so many uh, examples of folks who are good testers and programmer um, right uh, who who know the testing field in and out and then and and then they are absolutely good programmers right so so we would we would basically uh, see um, and talk about you know these issues these are not new issues everybody know this Uh, and i am seeing this from last 16 17 years of mine so i'll talk about standardizing data uh, that and, and, and you know how you can uh, you know uh, standardize your data and, and how you can do that uh, one of the example which i wanted to talk about is that and, and people would agree with me that you know in your organizations you would see that every project has got its own framework um Uh, uh and different technology right and then uh the question arises uh, how can i then make a recommendation engine work uh, because if i have different technology different uh, uh different uh, frameworks uh, that are there uh, there may be different tools i may be using uh, web driver io or i may be using um, selenium i may be using in any other tool right uh how how can i basically make sure that i standardize my data set because i want to create a recommendation engine that cut across all the apps right so i'll talk about that aspect uh in here as well right so how it was done previously right when when we used to like like 5 7 years back you know how we used to do it uh and everybody would would do the same way uh so what you would do is you would do some execution you would do your test executions uh that would get ingested into the results uh, you know that gets ingested to db and uh, people used to use a variety of services people use elk stack people used uh, their own custom apis that they can throw their executions into db and then what they used to do is uh, they used to do some fault uh, uh fault tracking or i would say failure probability uh on that data uh that you know that they have collected um and then what they will do is that you know they would make the test prediction so they what they will say what they will do here is they would see that the test case that have executed how many times it has failed versus how many times it has passed and then um it will make a prediction whether it need whether uh, the, the 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 team should basically run that test or not right uh however i would like to understand from the audience uh uh and you know what is the problem with this particular approach um uh, so anyone if they can uh, put it in the chat that would be great let me see the chat anyone what is the problem with this particular uh, okay pesticide paradox 
and anything else maybe the maintainability okay, okay. anything else not considering the risk of change components instead only the statistics no ci cd approach no fast feedback okay let me let me talk about uh, what exactly would be the issue here. Okay. just give me a minute Sure. So, if you ask me, right, and uh, you know, um, sorry about the transition, but but here, if you look at uh, the the tests that are getting flagged, right, uh, it will always flag your flaky tests. Okay, it will say that okay, some of the tests, you know, uh, sometimes it will pass, sometimes it will fail. Uh, so it will basically predict always your flaky test. Second is your, uh, it will always flag uh, test with high failure rate all the time, right? So there may be a bias, okay? It may be failing because of app or the the code, code base that you have created, right? It's faulty, right? There are a number of uh, uh, problem statements. So it, you cannot, basically choose that test because there is a bias involved right mm -hmm. second uh, the third is that you, there is no correlation or the connection between your application code that means what you're doing is that you are executing a set of tests each time and it is failing and you're flagging it but but if some some code is changing how can you even relate that whether I should run that test or not, okay, or whether uh, whether which ones are, are the right ones, right? So it will never uh, have any correlation with your code. Okay? Um, so what we have to do here is that we have to like like what Vikul's mentioned, right? These are four days, right? If you know how much amount of my code has changed and then you can have a correlation with your test you can actually do the targeted runs okay. and irony is that qa won't be given time and there will be constant pressure to run the test quicker and, and everybody will agree to, to me right even the drop will come at the last and qa will be pushed to complete their cycle isn't it right so, so this is a constant problem that that is always there. Uh, so this this approach has a problem, uh, you know, th this kind of problem. This correlation of the code. So you actually have to run all the tests each time, uh, or you can just run the failure, but it does not translate or, or have correlation to the code. So, so there is no connection. Right. So the classic challenges that I mentioned was that I have to perform exhaustive testing each time for the change, right? Before it gets merged into the main line, which leads to the high cycle time. So, so one of the constant problem that QA faces is high cycle time. They will always be mentioned that, you know, QA is taking large time. So, and, and then obviously we would like to run our test on CI, right? And if I put those tests on CI, you know, uh, it would start taking time because your test will take time. You don't know how much to run. Right? So, so there are meaningless tests that may run in the pipeline because they are not related to any code change uh, into the system. And the third one, obviously, you know, uh, that's a classic problem that QA was never given time uh, to do the regression. And and in, even if we get time, then you know uh, we need to run the test faster. So, how to basically solve or address these challenges? Okay. So what, what we can do, we can do the targeted test runs. Okay. So if there is a code change, we can exactly say how much tests do we need to run, how we need to do this. So you can use a probabilistic model. So, so in the last uh, slide, if you say we, we check, we basically got the failure probability. Okay? So you develop probabilistic model 
for identifying which test to run from the regression for a particular code change. Then I will show you how you will do it. Okay. Um, when I say probabilistic model, right? Um, in a probabilistic model, we can hypothesize and perform correlation between the parameters. They may be random uh, parameters. They may not so random parameters. Um, you know, and uh, there are completely random parameters. Okay, so, so, so that's where the probability. So we will may we will basically take uh, probability of my test failures and then start correlating with with the the code change. Now, so so still, I'm talking about the probability model on the test side, but I have not talked about how we can connect to the code, right? So there are some of the common approaches, and I was talking about standardizing your data, right? So one of the thing that you can do here is you can create a standard result set form from each of the frameworks. Uh, when I say standard result set, it can be a JSON object uh, which spits out from the, the, the run. And that is a standardized JSON that would spit out from all the frameworks that you have in the organization or on the project. Right? And that JSON, or that data gets ingested into the DB. Okay, so you ingest all the historical information of the test runs uh, from that apps into a centralized location and start performing correlation. So you need to first uh, make sure that the data is standardized. Second is that you can take the meta information of the build, okay, um, which gives you an idea of how much code change is there and start applying correlation with your unit tests if at all the unit tests are there in the project, right? So you can basically, you know, instrument your code um, and then you can basically, you know, start correlating with your test. Uh, the third common approach that people takes is understand the likelihood of the test that can fail uh, due to the certain code base. So this is a reverse engineer. And, and most of the QAs would, would ask this question to the devs, right? That, okay, you change this code, where do you think I go and test, right? Because they're talking about the targeted regression, right? And, and most of the time, you know, we may miss that scope uh, of QA and, and which leads to bugs. So, 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 so let, let's create a model which will basically take that decision, okay? And rather than reverse engineering, okay? So these are the three common approaches that people would take. Now, how you can build the model? You can basically use the gradient boosted decision tree model, okay? And you can read through it, you know, how, how this, this thing works. But it's basically a model which will basically um, understand the failure of that model and then learn from it and then continue uh, building it, okay? Uh, so a particular code change will find all the impacted tests and it will identify the likelihood of failure. So, but before doing this, what you have to do is you have to start using code coverage tools and start instrumenting your code because you need some probing uh, tools to basically give that code coverage whenever you will run their tests and start then then start doing that correlation with the gradient boosted decision tree only and it will start working for you. So how your model would look like, right? You have a code base, you instrument your code, instrumentation is something like adding probes in your code you execute your tests you ingest the coverage data the quality data and the the execution data into the db and then you run the gradient boosting model on top of that data right so you have the standardized data you have uh, the the coverage versus the test that you have executed data and then you would create the model on top once you do the model training, you can then start doing the prediction. You can do the code change. You can run the model and it will basically tell you the probability of your tests failure. Okay. And then you start ingesting your test selection information again. So what you do is we will feed this information back to the model each time we run this. Okay. And then keep on learning from it. Okay. So what would then happen is that when you do the code change and you execute your tests, uh, 
and run the model, you know, it will basically give you that failure probability um, of, of those tests. So this is how you can basically do the training and start doing the uh, uh, prediction. Some of the tools that you can get started with, you can use Istanbul for JS, you can use Clover, you can use Jcoco. These are some of the tools that you have, uh, you know, uh, for your code coverage, uh, you know, that you help you to instrument. Uh, you would, you can use WebDriver IO, Cypress, Selenium, Robo, Robot Framework, you know, to basically do the executions because you need the execution data, you need the coverage data. Then you can use either Spring, Flask, Python to basically create your uh, middleware, which will help you ingest all of these data into the DB. You can use Cassandra here and start mining the, those information through Spark. So these are some of the tools that you can connect and you can start building the, the, uh, the infrastructure for your model. Uh, data is important. You need to do a lot of ingestion uh, and historic uh, execution data uh, would help you to, you know, get that uh, decision uh, or, or the recommendation. I would say. With that, thank you very much. Uh, I'm. I'll open the floor for questions. Um, over to you, Shantanu. All right. Thank you so much, Somya, for that insightful session. And I think we can uh, move over to. Uh, Q&A. There are some questions that have already come over chat. So I think I'll just uh, uh, put them here right for you. <laughs> so the first one is from Manish Sen. Uh, which mm -hmm. focus more picking up tools or picking up uh, test frameworks? It is agnostic, right? It is agnostic of tool and it is agnostic of frameworks. What you need to do is you need to make sure that whichever tool you run, whichever framework you're using, there has to be a common format which needs to be, you know, which basically would be an output uh, of a run, basically, right? If you run like hundreds of tests, it should basically spit out those results in a standardized format. So it is agnostic whether it is a it is a it is a tool, it is a Selenium tool that you're using, Cypress, WebDriver, I, whichever tool you're using, it is agnostic. I hope I answered the question. Got it. I, I think we have a follow up from Manish here. But can we use Allure history trend lines? Uh, and let me just show it uh, on the stage itself. Sure. So, so think about this, right, Manish? Uh, Allure, well, Allure or any reporting tool, they need an underlying JSON to create their reports. They can't. You can't directly write an HTML, and nobody will write an HTML. What they do is they will create that JSON object and then feed that to. Uh, a service of theirs to basically create that engine, uh, create that report. So what you can do, you can pick up that JSON and you can standardize it, and then you can push it to your backend and it start ingesting, right? So so that way, is what you can do is your Allure data or your uh, custom reports data, right, or extend report data can can be pushed into your backend and then you can do the the, the analysis. I hope that answers your question, Manish. All right. Uh, so we'll just be moving on to the next question, which is how do biases affect such system from Mahati? Um, OK. Like, let me take an example. Let's assume that you have created a model um and let's assume that I, i'm just giving you a, a random uh, you know example here let's assume that i'm expecting 50 as a number okay and uh, i have created a model and it gave me uh, an answer as 52 do you think my model is correct or whether my model has a bias um, i'm sorry like you know uh, you you may be answering it but but it has a bias because your model, right, cannot be so close to what you're expecting, right? It has to be that there are biases, okay, uh, which will affect your model, okay? So when you would run your model, start looking at how 
it is behaving now there there is another uh, problem that that affects the systems and and you can call it as a bias as well that refreshing your production data in your lower environments right so each time you refresh your production data in your lower environments and you run something you would see that there is a there is a failure right so so your data uh, is always changing right it will basically adds more and more bias so you may need to create a model in such a way that you know uh, that it keeps on learning from it i hope i answered thank you so much for that somya uh, i think we have a lot of questions coming in uh, so i'll just uh, move to the next one so we have smart automation versus uh, traditional automation i i didn't quite get that question like start smart automation versus traditional automation okay uh, okay traditional automation is now leading to smart automation right uh, like um, uh vikul was giving an example of mabel right what they are doing is in analyzing the the way your tests are running and then predicting on uh the the run data or the execution data right so if you look at it there is nothing called as traditional automation or smart automation the traditional automation was smart enough to basically cut down the qa cycle time and the smart automation is the smart automation right so i would say that it it tends to the smart automation way so so more engineering is now getting involved in automation it it you know traditionally we would see that uh, the teams would talk about only functional testing right but but now with more engineering more tools coming in right it it is actually tend trending towards the smart automation got uh, so we have another question uh, from gustavo what tool do you recommend i use to automate a recommendation system with a lot of data and assert that the results are the expected ones did i have to populate the test data or taking screenshots and having historic data to compare each run let me read and rephrase it which tool do you so you want to automate a recommendation system okay interesting okay think about this gustavo like 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 it as a it is a black box okay um, and then start testing your system so for an example you know that you know uh, you you know uh, what is the what is the input and what is the output right there has to be an expected result in testing okay if you know the expected outcome and it and recommendation system will always give you the value in in the range okay so what you do is you basically keep pushing the inputs and whatever output that you are you are expecting has to be in the range so that would basically solve it so treat it as a black box to start with your basic testing and uh, did i have to populate test data or taking screenshots um obviously you need to basically start seeing that you know okay i will give you some more pointers here you can check the precision of the model the recall value of the model to basically basically understand how is your model behaving right when you keep pushing on the data let's assume that you do we do boundary value right we we send the minimum maximum a middle value negative set of values you see how the model is behaving right and and whether the accuracy of the model is dropping you know then the model has a bias and then you need to retrain or whatever it is right so so these are some of the pointers that you may need to start looking at when you're testing recommendation models hope that answers the question gustavo thank you so much for that somya uh okay moving on to i think a very common question that a lot of us might have <laughs> Should, should we automate where man test, test case time obvious manual testing takes less time so actually this is a very very uh, it's just a question nobody can answer uh, we always do automation where we have a process which takes a lot of time or there is a redundant process we need to do it each time for an example you you know people would ask you to run regression each time right why don't you automate it you know because the regression 
cycle let's assume is is 4 days why can't you do it in 1 hour right so so there is no definitive answer right when manual te- manual testing take less time uh, i would say that if the process is should be tested once do not automate it if the process is redundant automate it uh, if you want to uh, you know cut down cycle time uh, you know you have you need to have reusability do automation hope i make sense i think that definitely makes sense it just helps you in regression every time because you don't need to do it again and again right mm-hmm. all right uh moving on to the next one if we are moving more and more towards microservices and bounded context systems is it possible to have fairly quick feedback with lower layer tests like unit tests or integrations what is the necessity mm-hmm. for recommendation models only for e2 tests okay okay <laughs> most of the time in my career i have never seen i have not seen people writing unit tests okay this is a culture that has been in the industry from last 4 5 years because everybody wants to test their code quicker and want faster feedback okay that is why uh, all of these tests uh, have been written obviously unit testing is preferred why we want to do recommendations as models or recommend why we want to create a recommendation engine is that when your regression pack is large and i have seen as large as 14000 test cases that they want to run uh, to as minimum as hundreds of cases right how would you determine how much to run right and none of these guys right the unit integration will help you to basically make that judgment what you would do as a tester is you would like to run all the tests but i is it making sense because the developer has changed <clears throat> developer has changed one commit right a small piece of code which is not affecting other modules so why to test for everything right? why to waste time so so that's a necessity of having a recommendation engine right it can be on e2 e integration right you know it, it's a test basically right so if there's a change in the code i need to know how much i need to test okay uh, so the next one we have uh related to the linking the code coverage data and the code base okay so <clears throat> um what you can do is you start looking at uh, some documentation on code instrumentation okay so there are two type of instrumentation in instrumentation that happens if you are if you are having a java application you you can basically instrument your code at a jvm level so you need not to write probes inside your code but you can use the jvm uh, layer to basically you know understand what are your classes running you know and then and and do do the the coverage generally i prefer to write probes into the code which was because it is more accurate in in the nature so read about the instrumentation of your code once you instrument the code you would then easily understand you know how to you know uh, how the coverage data is getting prepared by that tool so i would suggest if you are a js guy javascript guy then you can use istanbul it has a very good documentation uh, you can use the most popular is open clover or jcoco for java so you can have a look into it uh but but read the documentation on instrumentation it will give you more information of you know uh, and there's no linking right obviously when you instrument and you run this tool it will always spit out your coverage data all right uh, thank you so much for that somya uh so the next question we have from azhar as a qa uh, what are the ways to improve impact analysis if change request comes up instead of asking the dev team first hmm. that is why we want to build we want to be much more smarter than our devs even think <laughs> and this we think uh, uh, with the era of shift left and and all of this right we we are actually inching towards the development process more and more right so uh, if you have a large program and you new uh, there's no uh, right or wrong right because everybody is concerned about the quality of the product right so i always ask my developers you know what to test right so no hard and fast rule but obviously these kind of systems will help you because that will make you make uh, make 
or help you to basically take intelligent decision okay in, into the project so so that is why uh, you know uh, we would basically you know create this this systems all right uh, the next question we have from uh, vivek uh, how do you make sure if it's functional failures or failures due to environments does this play any role in recommendations yes they are so what you're <clears throat> basically doing is uh, if you look at uh, the the talk that i've given um, there is people used to basically do a uh, failure analysis and on that base failure analysis they will predict that what test to run but it does not make sense because it never correlates to my code right what we are talking here is that you you co correlate not your failures of the test but the test execution run information with your code base okay so what would then happen is that whenever you there is a code change it will predict what are the tests that you need to run it will not point to you that these are the failure tests and you should run am i making sense when you would run those tests and if it fails then you can get get more stats that you know why it is failing whether my my, my developer is making the same mistake on the same code you know it is possible right that that every time you know they miss a miss a a condition on 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 the same code base and it spits out uh, the same failure of the case so you can then start correlating it am i making sense mm, yes i i think you are oh, man. Yeah. okay it's not about up. functional failures or failures due to environment right it is it is you, you are basically classifying your failures of your case right uh and then you can you can always do it later uh but but here first we need to see you know what are the tests that i need to run and then run them and then check you know, why that failure has happened um, that will happen right? hope that answers the question vivek yeah all right thank you uh okay next we have a couple of questions uh, from rahul uh the first one is how can visual validation automation testing uh okay so um think about this rahul okay um as i mentioned it is tool agnostic okay uh whether you are using visual validation using apply tools or any custom class that you are using which will help you to do it you have to spit out the same kind of results each time from your different tool sets so for an example let's assume i'll i'll tell you the table structure I'll, i'll give you a table structure let's assume that i executed tests uh, 100 tests right i know the the what are the tests i have executed so i can have uh, in my table all the tests right and then i can tag them whether there's a pass or a fail or a no run what kind of tagging right so think about now an object that you are spitting out from a visual validation which will basically give you the number of tests what passed what failed what no run and all of it right now now think about that you are not using visual validation but you are using some other tool like selenium right you you executed a test and you know what are the tests executed which how much are passed failed and like that so so if if you are visualizing you would see that what i have done is i've standardizing the data that is spitting out of each tool in a format on which i can build the model am i making sense yeah uh, and i think we're just uh, running out of time as well so there's just one last question that uh, we'll take up which is suggested reads on the topic if there are any uh, some yes there are so uh, first of all uh, the basics is that and and most of the qs do not do this um uh, and this this thing that it is developer job there's nothing called as developer job or qa job to be very frank in this industry nowadays so first thing that you need to start reading is about uh about code coverage so how you can determine the code coverage um uh, start writing some basic java code and start instrumenting it uh, and see you know how whether you can able to spit out the uh, coverage data then uh then start 
learning about machine learning basic model like an SVM, random forest, why do we use it, where we can use it and like that. And then start building your knowledge base. And if you have any more questions, you can connect me on LinkedIn and I'll be happy to help. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful session, Sonia. Uh, I hope all of our viewers uh, found this session insightful. Uh, we would be hosting all our recorded session on YouTube as well. So you can go back and listen to them again and share them with your peers as well. Uh, happy testing and have a great day. Thank you very much, friends, and have a nice evening. Bye.